Let me ask you a question. Do you remember your first job? <laughs> well, I do. <clears throat> it's an apple orchard in Perth, Western Australia. I, I, uh, I didn't necessarily pick the apples, but I certainly boxed them up. I made all the boxes that uh, put them all together. Uh, I was probably about 14 in those days. I um, remember choosing these red delicious apples and biting into them. That was amazing. <clears throat> I remember also coming to America in March. You can, you missed my apple, apple thing up there. There you go. So um, uh, we are, I'm going to show you my, an apple orchard in Australia there. Uh, eventually we'll go up there. Um, <clears throat> and then I remember arriving in America in March 1969. And uh, I was uh, all of 15. Uh, it was snowing in New York City. 39 years later, I was down here at Century 2 being naturalized or... Uh, sworn in as an American citizen. I was a legal alien for a number of years, 39 to be exact. I kept my antennas down most of the time. And that was a very special experience for me. Now, I'd like to compare those two experiences, working for Tom in Australia on the apple orchard and being sworn in as an American citizen. We're talking about Becoming a disciple. Joining the kingdom of God. You know, when we think about becoming a Christian, we think oftentimes, you know, becoming, you know, becoming part of a church, attending church and these kind of things. Well, I hope to help you understand today that it's a lot more than that. So, what is becoming a disciple of Jesus really like? How does it really begin? Is it like becoming a citizen of a new kingdom or a country? Is it like that? Or is it more like what happens when you begin a job? Now, which is it? What do you think? When I became naturalized, and I was down there at Century 2 in the Mary Jane Teal Theater. Some of you have been in that very steep one. I was in there with a lot of people. We got to pledge the, or to say the, Pledge of Allegiance, which I'm not sure I could quote perfectly here anyway. But I did that. <clears throat> then there was applause. I think we all applauded. Got a little flag. We walked out. That was it. Yay. Walked out. And I was walked in an Australian. Walked out Australian-American. That's, that's the way you do it now, isn't it? African-American, Australian-American. So I'm an Australian-American. Um, actually, I do have dual citizenship. I could go get a new passport. But by and large, when I walked out there, nobody told me to do anything. I had just become a new citizen. Now, when I went to work for Tom on that apple orchard, the first day, he said, Philip, this is what you're to do. He gave me a task. So what is it like to become a disciple of Jesus Christ? Is it like becoming a citizen? Or is it like beginning a new job? Well, let me suggest the fact that it should be the latter. Like when you join a job. You're ready to work. I became, I publicly acknowledged Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in a tent crusade. Has anyone ever been in a tent crusade? Okay, we've got a few people there. Generally, the more mature ones among us. <laughs> How many have never been in a tent crusade? Can I see your hands? I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, my goodness. That's really something. Um, sorry, we, we don't have our... I, I was at uh, Manning, South... I mean, Western Australia. My dad had a tent put up there. I remember clearing the ground. And uh, in that tent crusade, my dad preached for six weeks. During that time, my mother was in hospital with polio. My grandparents had come over to look after us. I was nine at the time, and I remember at the end of the service, my dad would always play the same song for the invitation. 
just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And, you know, it's just as I am, I come, you know. And remember, I was the third row down. I walked down the front and I was crying and was deeply moved. That was in about June of 1963. It's called the Manning Mission. I actually looked that up on the web and I thought, I wonder if there's a tent crusade that actually someone took a picture and put it on the web called the Manning Mission. So I did find a picture of a tent, of a tent crusade, of a big tent. And then there was a bunch of people sitting and it was taken from the back. And what was in one of those seats was a lady sitting with a football jersey. And on the back of the jersey was Manning. <laughs> it was probably Peyton Manning's shirt. So that's the closest I got to a tent crusade with the Manning mission, but I didn't get that one exactly. We moved here, and I, let me tell you what happened right after I accepted Jesus. And, and can you think back the time when you made a personal commitment to Christ? Was there a time when you said, I do? It might have been coming forward in a service. It might have been when someone prayed with you personally. But I, I feel one of the best things is that you have at least a date or a memory of that. I still remember going forward, so to speak. That's the term we used. But I have prayed with many people myself to accept Jesus. It was a specific time, a specific decision. We oftentimes call it a decision for Christ. Have you done that? Do you remember that time? Do you remember that moment? It's good to have a moment that you can remember. I don't know that we just sort of slide in to becoming a disciple. When Jesus said to his disciples, follow me, they remembered that moment that they said yes. Well, after that moment, within a day or two, my father called me into his office. I remember this moment as well. And he says, now that you've become a Christian, this is what you need to do. This is next. What was happening there? My father began to make me a disciple. I began to learn, and I was being tutored. Tutored. <laughs> Not tutored. I was being tutored <laughs> by my father. He was my teacher, my disciple maker. I think one of the tragedies we have in the church is that many of us in this room cannot identify anybody who has been your personal tutor in the kingdom of God. And as I get older in the ministry, I'm moving more and more to the place where I believe that every person, every disciple needs a personal trainer. You need a tutor. You need someone who's looking out for you and can say, Mark, how are you doing today? How are you doing in the Word? I can say that here, but you're not my disciples. Some of you are learning with me. But I think you need that loving accountability. Don't you? Don't you? Let me say this to you. If you have that loving accountability, you'll grow faster. You will grow faster. Isn't it true? I was married to Kathy on Groundhog's Day 38 years ago. It was February, and we decided that the best place to go for a honeymoon was Colorado. We went skiing in Breckenridge. Her parents were very wise. I had never skied in my life. Kathy was suave. I'm like, you know how it is. Some of you have been skiing, you know, it's like, you know, we got the old V there trying to do this. They were smart. They gave me personal lessons. I went up there for the first day and I had a tutor showed me how to ski. A whole day. I was an expert by the end of the day. Needless to say, I started to ski with Kathy, and my one memory was is the fact that I turned around. We were on this very small slope, I think probably going to get on one of the lifts, and I, was, I had my ski straight, and I couldn't stop for the light. I mean, I was, and she just stood there, and I ran right, I skied right into her, not very fast. And then I said, why don't you watch where I'm going? 
<laughs> so the lessons that help, I mean, that made a huge difference. I was skiing much quicker because I had that personal attention from someone who was more experienced than me. For the many years that I have been a follower of Jesus Christ, I am more convinced today than ever before that being a follower or a disciple of Jesus Christ is not intuitive. Do you understand what I mean by that? It's not easy. You need someone to come alongside of you as a friend and to train you and help you grow in the Lord. I needed that. Right now in Boise, Idaho, there is a wonderful lady that as I understand just from the last couple days that she's there in the hospital or she's under the care of hospice. Her name is Sunday. When she came to Central Christian Church in 1970, she was, her name was Sunday Lebeff. She was single. She was called to be the youth director of our church. I was a senior in high school learning to play the guitar. I can actually play this thing a little bit. But I played it only in my room. I was a secret star. Nobody knew about me except me. Until she said, why don't you play for a singing group that I'm going to start. So, Sunday invited me into her group. But she just didn't stop there with inviting me into a group. She came by one day with a little yellow bug. That's a Volkswagen for some of you younger folks. A Volkswagen convertible. And I remember Sunday said, would you like to go for a ride? And she put me in that little car with her. And, and here's this new lady that's really in about three or four or five years older than me. I mean, she's graduated from college. And I was still in high school. And, uh, and she started to ask me about my relationship with Jesus. She began to question my growth. And then I was sharing with her some of my concerns. And I shall always remember... She said, well, let's just pray about that. Now, we're driving in her little yellow bug. We're not in church. We're not in a meeting. We're in her car. And she's driving, and she's starting, and she says, let's pray about that. And before I know it, she's there talking to the Lord while she's steering the car, driving along. And I have never seen anything like this in my life, praying in the car while you're driving. I had never seen anything like that. That was the beginning of a new mentoring relationship. And Sunday began to disciple me along with many other young people. By the way, that group of 10 that I was the first guitarist for, and I will tell you, certainly not the best. I remember Molly Daniels came and joined, and she teach me, taught me a lot. Um, but anyway, she mentored me too. Anyway, I, that group grew to 300 young people. We sang at Century 2, had an amazing experience. And Sunday began to train us to train other young people. We had people training people who trained people who trained people. Do you understand how it went? And I can look back on my dad and on my dear friend Sunday. And, and what I meant to say is that Sunday has a brain tumor now. And as of the, yesterday, I heard that it has come back with a vengeance. And so she's battling for her life. Would you mind stopping with me just right now and let's just pray for her. Father, I just thank you for, first of all, every person in this room. And Lord, I, I just sense how much you love them. And you, and, and there's some of us in this room, some who in this room need a spiritual parent, the same way Sunday was for me. She helped me, she trained me, prepared me when I became a youth pastor. Lord, I don't know exactly what's going on with her, but I know you do. I know she's a great woman of faith. So, Lord, I'm asking you either heal her, deliver her from that brain tumor, or, Lord, draw her to the wonderful reward that you have for her, quietly, painlessly, and in peace. So I just thank you for Sunday, and we just lift her up, Lord. Most in here don't, all in here don't know her, but you know her, and I know her. Just touch her and help her, heal her. That's our request. All in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. So that's what I want to talk a little bit about today. Becoming a disciple is not just being identified with Jesus. Say, I believe in Jesus. That's a place to start, yes. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, knowing who this Jesus really is. 
but it is the idea that I need to ask a question. After acknowledging Jesus as your Lord, you need to ask the right question. What exactly is that question? Well, it's on the back of your bulletin. It is simply this, Lord, what do you want me to do? That really should be what you do every time you get up every day. Lord, what do you want me to do? See, the Christian life, the discipling life, is a doing life. It's not just a being. And indeed, we are, we are disciples. It is about being. But we are also being given tasks to do. What do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? What do you want me to say? Lord, I'm your servant. Would it not make sense that once you've become a follower of Christ, you've invited Christ into your life, you've received the gift of eternal life, that's settled. You're good. <laughs> your sins have been wiped away on the cross of Jesus Christ. You're good. You're free. Have you had that feeling, by the way, where you think, whoa, it's all gone. <laughs> if you've not, you've got to get it. <laughs> you've got to have that place. You've got to have that time where you know, I have no guilt. When you come up here and you take from, as we talked about earlier, the Lord's Supper, and you take a little piece of bread, and you take this cup, and you say, Lord, I've sinned, and I give you my sins. You know what he says? I'll take them. <laughs> and I can say, and you should be able to say, after doing this or any time, when you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That means after you've said, Lord, every sin that I can think of right now, I admit, I agree that I messed up. Now, you can do that right now, where you're at. You could have done that in preparation for coming to the table. In fact, if you've never had that feeling, if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, today is the day to do that. And he will take away all of your sins. I mean, every single mistake, every dumb thing you've done. So you can honestly stand and say, I stand before you, no guilt. I stand before you, no guilt. Do you feel guilty today at all? You don't have to. You don't have to. You can receive his forgiveness. And you can forgive everybody that's ever hurt you. And guess who else you can forgive? Yourself. Totally let it go. Be totally free. What do I do, Lord? What do you want me to do? You know, that's a good question. You look here in Acts chapter 2, and just uh, I'm going to share just a couple of verses here with you. Acts chapter 2 and verse 36. Peter, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit fell down on all the 120 in the upper room. They had these little flames of fire appear on their heads. <laughs> I look over at you, Steve, and I see that little flame of fire. <laughs> Can you imagine in that room, they walk up and say, Jan, I need to tell you something. You've got a little flame of fire on your head. Jan looks back at me and says, Philip, guess what? You do too. I do. Because, you know, you can't see your own flame up there. And then the next thing you know, and you're just serving someone. That's, you loved her. You helped her. Christianity, making disciples, is about relationship and helping people answer the question, Lord, what do I do? What do I do now? What's next? What's next? Who cares about you? Who cares about your spiritual walk? John, who asks you? How are you doing in the Word of God besides Carrie? <laughs> so, that's the question we want to do. So, would you stand with me here? And let's just, let's just finish this. I think.